Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hand of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. First reading is from the book of Isaiah, from chapter 52, verse 13, to chapter 53, verse 12. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made the intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are so far from my cry and from my words of my distress. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all 
and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. But not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. May many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a pot sheared. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of elders circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. But not far away, O Lord, you are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of the wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren, in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise nor arbor the poor in, the po or the, in their poverty, nor does he hide his face from them. But, he cry, but when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in this great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations bow before him. For king, kingship belongs to the Lord, he rules over the nations. To him alone, all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading of the letter to the Hebrews. Chapter 10, verses 16 to 25. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my, my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised his, his faith faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, 
he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing that all was to happen, to him came forward and asked him, whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so that if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into a sheep. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officers, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Aeneas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another apostle followed Jesus. Since the disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now, the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is this how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Aeneas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, are you not also one of the disciples? Are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, 
a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and not be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to him, take him yourself and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to be called because he was claimed to be the son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, who gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know? that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, 
the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judgment bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked him, surely I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So as they took Jesus and carried the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. The congregation, as they are able, may stand at this time. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They took his tunic now and the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And it was what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, 
The Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was the great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first of the others who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now, there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby. They laid Jesus there. The Passion of our Lord, according to John. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good Friday. A couple questions could be asked about Good Friday. Probably more than one question could be asked about Good Friday. Why is it good? After hearing the reading of the Passion, we're trying to find what, what good is there in there. Another question that could be raised is, who killed Jesus? Was it Judas's betrayal? Was it the jealousy of the chief priests? Was it our sin? Those, those are real questions. But let's stop and, and look at some of this text. Now, it's, it's not possible to go over the whole two chapters of this, but let's look at the high points of this passion or, or some of the high points of this passion. Jesus knows that his time has come. It is, as he has stated many times, this is why I'm here. I came here for this very reason. And yes, I know this is going to be uncomfortable, but in obedience to my Father, because the love that my Father has for you and the love that I have for you and in obedience to my Father, I do this of my own free will of my own free will, I will suffer, I will die. And he does not back away from this. We have here and we've seen two really interesting phenomena here. We've seen a betrayal by one of his disciples, that is one of his students, 
We've seen a denial of one of his students. Judas, who betrayed him. Peter, who denied him. People who do not know him are even calling for his death. Pilate is looking at Jesus and saying, what is truth? And truth is standing right in front of you. Truth is standing right in front of us. And yet, we continue to ask that question. What is truth? What is it? Is it the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That he has come for this purpose, to die for all of our sins? And then we get to answer one of those questions. He dies for our sins, but when we read the text, it's by his choice. So we actually answer two questions. One, nobody killed Jesus. Jesus gave up the spirit of his own. Remember, he said, it is finished, and then he gave up his spirit. And he has said before, I have the ability to lay it down and to take it up. So there is nobody on the face of this earth that has the ability to kill Jesus. We may be responsible, no, not maybe, we are responsible through our sin for Jesus having to suffer this shameful death. But the actual death of himself, he determined when that would happen. It is the power that the Father gave him. But let's go a little bit further. Because our first question was, why is this a good Friday? Jesus is on a cross, crucified. And let me clarify something. Crucified means that he was put on a cross, and in his case, he was nailed to the cross. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, Roman crucifixion was very precise. They knew exactly where to put these nails in the hands and in the feet. Actually, it was in the wrists that they actually did it, and in the feet that it did not cause a lot of bleeding. Yes, it was painful, but it was also secure. The other means that they would do is to tie, actually take rope and tie it. But in Jesus' case, they actually nailed him to the cross. Pain. But you've heard me say before, does not sin cause pain and suffering? And the answer is yes. It does cause pain and suffering. So Jesus has taken all this pain and suffering unto to himself for each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. He's taken that pain and that suffering. And he does that willingly. Willingly. While on the cross. Look at the care that he has for his family. Now, in particular, it's for his mother. You have to remember, in this day and time, it is a patristic society. So if a woman does not have a son or a husband to take care of her, she's at the mercy of whoever might give her a handout. And yet what Jesus does is he makes certain that his earthly mother is taken care of. He's on a cross suffering but he takes care of everything, everything. 
mother, woman, your son, and to his beloved disciple who is John. Behold your mother. From that point on, a blessed mother is taken care of. That's not by accident. That's because Jesus always makes certain that everything is taken care of. We are taken care of. We are guarded and protected at all times and in all places. And because of his death, because of his death, because he had to die, he will rise again. He will not stay dead. But we have to get to this day, Friday, for him to die so that we can live. And for me, that's what makes Friday good. Because if we didn't have a good Friday where bad things happen, no good would come out of it. Let me say that again. If we didn't have this day where truly bad things happen, crucifixion is a terrible way to die. You, you actually suffocate in that dying. You, you, you see, that's why they asked to have the legs broken so that they would die quicker because with your arms stretched out, and here's your anatomy class for the day, with your arms stretched out, your diaphragm, which we all know is the muscle that helps you to breathe, that, that is impossible for you to do. So what those who were crucified would do is they would sort of push up on their legs so that they could get a breath. But if I break your legs, you can't push up. You can't push up. Three hours of that, having difficulty to breathe. Having extreme difficulty to breathe. And yet, when you read the text, see how clear Jesus' messages are. That's why I said, nobody killed him. Read the text. He gave up the ghost of his own volition when he was ready to give it up. But in doing that, that's what made Friday good. Because what we have to look forward to now is now he has died for all of us. He has taken all of our sin, all of that suffering, all of that pain, all of that not being able to breathe. He's taken that unto himself. And when, in two more days, we will rise as the victor of death so that when we do sin, believing that he is the son of God, we can say, I am sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. And know, and know that that sin is forgiven and forgotten. I don't know why the scholars call it Good Friday, but I know why I call it Good Friday. It's because of that reason that I've just explained to you. Because it was out of the goodness of God's heart for us, for each and every one of us, that we live. But not only that we live, but we are able to live with him. Good Friday. And it is a good day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear people of God, 
our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, and that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for the bishop and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, Receive our supplication and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindly we pray in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love, and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their affliction. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, and for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience.
mercifully God, creator of all peoples of the earth and lover of souls. Have compassion on all who do not know you as you revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life that, with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fulfillment of joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life on the day of resurrection. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence. Carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord. And praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon the earth your saving help among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood has redeemed us, Save us and help us, we humbly beseech thee, O Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls. Now and in the hour of our death, give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Behold the cross on which was hung the salvation of the world. Behold the cross 
on which was hung the salvation of the world. Behold the cross on which was hung the salvation of the world. 